Peace be with you. Welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. We are glad to be worshiping together. We will be celebrating the sacrament of communion together, so please gather your elements if you haven't already. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We worship in the season of Lent, a time to examine our hearts and our lives. And journey with Christ through the suffering of the world. God has marked us as beloved dust. And, and call us together to worship. Trusting in God's wisdom and strength, rather than our own, let us confess our sins and open ourselves to God's forgiveness and grace once more. Let us pray. Merciful God, how unaware we are. We sin against you without even knowing it. Save us from willfully ignoring your way. 
let your commandments rule and guide us. Forgive us for worshiping anyone or anything except you. Forgive us for failing to honor all our relationships. Help us to speak words of blessing and kindness rather than words that belittle or destroy. Forgive us for thinking everything depends on our efforts and power. Help us to depend on you alone and to rest in your peace. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again, we are forgiven and set free to live in faithfulness with God and with one another. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. It's almost spring, and spring is a time that we start to do some cleaning. We might clean out our closets, we might clean out our toy chests. I'm sure there's some toys that you don't play with anymore that you could donate, or maybe some clothes that don't fit you anymore, and maybe your parents could give those away. I'm sure your parents have always done some cleaning around the house and sprucing up. Sometimes there's so much clutter that you can't even find the good stuff. In our Bible story today, we hear that Jesus cleaned out a temple. There was a lot of bad stuff going on in the temple. There were people buying and selling things. There were cows, there were sheep, there were goats, all sorts of things that really don't belong in a temple. We wouldn't want those in our church, right? So Jesus got a little bit angry because the temple was built as a place for people to come and worship God through prayer and sacrifice. Jesus wanted the temple to be used only for worship and not for buying and selling things. Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to clear the clutter out of our lives so that we can have room to let Jesus in. Thank you for Jesus who shows us how to live and worship you. In his name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Spirit of God, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's reading is from Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover by them is your servant mourned. In keeping them there is a great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from their insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and of my meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. 
After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The late, great Congressman John Lewis, Georgia Five, came to speak at the Princeton Seminary Chapel a few years ago, and it was as if a rock star had come to campus. He was overrun by eager young 20-somethings, and he graciously posed for countless selfies on his way out the door. And I was trying to get a picture, but I could only see the top of that beautiful bald pate of his but I have pictures on my phone of the top of John Lewis's head. I keep John Lewis words in my wallet from a pretty famous tweet of his from 2018. He tweeted, our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble necessary trouble. That quote about good trouble, necessary trouble, keeps resonating as I was thinking about this passage from John this week, John's account of Jesus at the temple during the Passover. Jesus wades deep into some necessary trouble at the temple. In John, the cleansing of the temple appears at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's his first public act. In the other three Gospels, this happens at the very end of Jesus' life, in the last week of his life. And in John, this takes place uh, after Jesus has changed the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. That was his first sign. And so this incident at the temple is Jesus' first public appearance. It's his introduction to ministry. It's quite a way to begin one's ministry. And Jesus is getting himself into some necessary trouble as he enters the outer courtyard, the Gentiles court of the temple, and he is appalled by what he sees there. So, you know, some of you are these people. Religious pilgrims have been traveling for Jerusalem for at least 3,000 years. In Jesus' day, pilgrims would travel up to Jerusalem to be in or near the temple during the High Holy Days. And so an entire industry had sprung up to accommodate Passover pilgrim needs. Pilgrims walking uphill for days to Jerusalem couldn't take the unblemished livestock with them that were necessary for a temple sacrifice. So they would get into town and then they would acquire uh, what they needed to present for sacrifice. And so this market evolved over centuries to accommodate pilgrimage needs. And the Roman coins of empire, right? Uh, The Roman Empire coins were certainly, quite literally, not kosher within the precincts of the temple. So money had to be exchanged so that the sacrifices could be bought with money that was usable in the temple. So there's this whole market economy that evolves over centuries. And all this commerce within the temple precincts brought in um, quite a bit of revenue because there was a temple tax. And those funds would have been utilized to clean the sanctuary, to continue working on the buildings. The the temple was still somewhat under construction. To pay the temple support staff, to pay the facilities staff, to keep up the grounds. Starting to sound familiar, isn't it? Pilgrims were pretty messy. They tended to just drop stuff wherever they were, so somebody had to clean the grounds. Sanctuary upkeep costs money, and don't we know that here? Some things haven't really changed. So because this is John's gospel, which always has many layers going on in it, Jesus' good trouble at the temple marketplace has a lot of layers to it. And because it's the gospel of John, more questions are posed than are ever answered. If last week's scripture in part 
raise the question, what is discipleship? This week's lesson might be asking, what is the church? Or perhaps even, what is a church building for? What's an appropriate use for a church building? Can church buildings be used for revenue streams? These are all quite interesting and ironic questions to be asking in a year where we haven't really been in the church buildings. I just want to say that I hope we've learned in this pandemic year that the church is way more than its buildings. We've been doing a lot of church this last year. So you may remember that in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Old Testament, the Lord accompanied the people wherever they went. The Lord tabernacled with the people wherever they were. And it took generations for God to be convinced that the idea of a sanctuary was actually a good idea. And then David uh, wanted to build a sanctuary, a located sacred space, a place set apart for the worship of God that was sufficiently grand. And God said to him, no, you're not the person. Um, you've led a complicated life. You're not the person. Your son will do it. And so Solomon oversaw construction of the first temple in Jerusalem. That temple was destroyed and rebuilt twice. And in Jesus' time, King Herod, yes, that King Herod, had almost finished rebuilding the second temple in Jerusalem in the hopes that it would appease the local people and quell any local rebellion. Um, Palestine was at the kind of the outpost of the Roman Empire. They were hard to govern. It was a showpiece, this second temple, and people flocked to it, including Jesus. Jesus, who did not make his home anywhere, right? He lived a kind of a wandering life during his ministry on earth. As soon as he was old enough to leave home, he did, and he didn't make another home. He taught in synagogues along the way, but didn't locate himself in a synagogue as rabbis usually did at the time. And for me, the whole of scriptural witness suggests a kind of divine ambivalence about sanctuary buildings. Interesting to think about that. God is always on the move. God can't be contained or constrained or settled in a house of worship. Sometimes people worship the sanctuary more than they revere the divine. So sanctuaries that, you know, it, it, the, it's a mixed bag here, I think. Jesus flips the script on the idea of temple in this text very deliberately. So we see in John that Jesus is angry and Jesus isn't really angry all that often in the Gospels, but he's angry in this lesson. He's angry about what he witnesses within the temple precincts. So he runs the animals out and he overturns the accounting tables and he just causes a ruckus, makes a mess of the whole thing. And he's yelling, stop, stop making my father's house a marketplace. This is Jesus the disruptor. You see him in every gospel. He's actually quite more Jesus the disruptor in Mark, but today we're in John. Jesus, who begins his public ministry by antagonizing the religious authorities, and the relationship is only going to go downhill from here. The religious leaders, or the church staff, have lost sight of the sole purpose of the sanctuary, which is the worship of God. Prophet has overtaken purpose. Kind of a mission creep going on. And what's interesting about this is this is Jesus' first appearance on the scene. The religious authorities haven't seen him before, and so they're intrigued by him at this point. They're not exactly angry with him. They seek a sign. They've been told by the Hebrew Scriptures to seek a sign for the one who is coming, for the new age that is coming. And so they asked Jesus for a sign that would establish his authority to upend these long-standing commercial enterprise traditions. 
What does he mean, my father? So they ask him for a sign. This being the Gospel of John, they don't really get one, at least not the one they're seeking. So this is the way that Jesus deliberately chooses to introduce himself and his public ministry to literally overturn the tables in the sanctuary, to literally upend the normal order of the day. And when the religious authorities ask him for proof of his authority to do these things, they miss the sign because he is the sign. I don't think any of us should feel badly. This is the Gospel of John. It's written so that we all miss the sign <laughs> until we get the whole picture. Jesus is the sign. Jesus himself is the new sanctuary, the temple. That beautiful passage in the beginning of John, right? The word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled, that's what that word is, among us. That's Jesus. Jesus is the temple. And so he quite cryptically refers to his death and resurrection, the body which will be destroyed and raised, resurrected in three days. And the religious leaders and the disciples are like, um, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. What are you talking about? He's not talking about the building. He's talking about himself. The religious leaders and the disciples miss the point which is the usual setup in the Gospel of John. Jesus is always having a much deeper conversation than his conversation partners are aware of. So Jesus flips the script on sanctuary, on temple. Jesus flips the script on what we've gotten used to, what we've come to see as normal, what we've come to think of as essential. This text asks us, what have we normalized and why? Sometimes in the life of a community, in the life of a family, right? A slow accommodation process sort of unfolds over time, a sort of mission creep where you find yourself someplace you never intended to be because you weren't really thinking about what you were doing. There was no one single moment that anybody has unearthed where the temple staff were sitting around in the staff meeting going, okay, let's just open a market. That makes sense. We'll make some money. It just sort of unfolded over time when these pilgrims kept showing up and the rules needed to be followed, right? It just happened over time, step by step, which is how things happen, unless we're paying attention. This text interrogates us. We think we read Bible texts, but they read us. What tables would Jesus be overturning here, right? What would Jesus be upending here? What is Jesus upending here? What necessary trouble is Jesus stirring up? among us. And so the disciples are looking on and trying to make sense of this person they just agreed to follow who is trashing the outer court of the temple. They recall a verse from Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal, Z-E-A-L, one of those Bible words. And they use that to explain Jesus' actions. Zeal for the house of his father leads Jesus to disrupt the ordinary business of the day. And so this text interrogates us again, right? About what are we zealous? What do we care enough about to overturn tables, to upend normal life? What commitments do we have that would lead us into good and necessary trouble. What do we get worked up about? So maybe zeal, zealot comes from zeal. Maybe zeal is what is really at play here. What are we zealous for? 
What are we zealous for in the details and minute particulars of our church budget, of our bandwidth, of our everyday decisions, right? What are we zealous for? For where our zeal is, there will our hearts be also. Little play on something you've heard before, right? Where our zeal is, there will our hearts be also. That's something that I'm going to chew on for a few weeks. It's rattling around in my head and in my heart. So I invite you to chew on that with me. Thanks be to God. Amen. this time in the service, I invite you to make an offering. Let us dedicate ourselves once more to God. Let us offer to God our zeal, our commitments, and our gifts through the ministry of this congregation. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this table, we learn through bread and cup that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Here we taste and see the power of grace, the power of mercy, the power of the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ welcomes to his table everyone who wants to follow him and to know him better. So come, eat, drink, and be filled. Let us pray. O God, creator of our wilderness world, O God, savior of the lost, O God, comforter of the sick and suffering, we give you thanks for your everlasting might. We glorify you for your covenant of mercy. For 40 days, you cleansed the earth with the waters of the flood. For 40 days, you illumined Moses with the words of your law. For 40 years, you fed your people with manna from heaven. You became truly human in Jesus, our brother, for 40 days, with fasting and prayer, he renounced the power of the devil. We extol his life. We lament his death. We celebrate his resurrection. Transform us, O God, with your lively spirit. Make this food into manna for our journey, the body and blood of your Son. Grant us repentance. Teach us your words of wisdom and justice. Renew the whole earth with baptismal grace. At the last, lead all your pilgrim people through our deserts to your Easter garden. To you, O God, creator, savior, comforter, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be our worship and praise, adoration and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. And so we remember how on the night he gave himself up for us, our Savior took bread, and having given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so now we invite you to taste of the bread of heaven. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this, remembering me.
For every time you eat this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the Lord until he comes again. Drink you of this. And now let us pray. Thank you, gracious God, for giving us bread for the journey of these 40 days. As we travel on through the wilderness, help us to share your grace with others and draw us ever closer to you. Hear us now as we lift the needs of our world before you. We pray for people who are victims of crime, from petty theft to murder, we pray that those harmed will find healing and will dwell in safety. Hold especially close to your heart, O God, those who have lost a loved one to violence, and help us to offer tenderness and care in their struggles and grief. We pray also for those who have committed crimes, that they may seek and find forgiveness and begin a new life of responsibility and integrity before you and in the community. We pray for healing and reconciliation where trust has been broken, hostility has flared or misunderstanding has grown. Restore us not only to one another, but reconcile us to ourselves and to you, loving God. If restoration proves beyond hope, then grant new beginnings and possibilities for all. In every relationship, we seek your grace as we honor others by caring for them being truthful and working for their welfare. Root out in us any jealousy toward what others possess and let generosity grow in and among us instead. Gracious God, we pray for those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit, for those lonely and isolated from community, and for those burdened by guilt or grief, by depression or despair. We pray particularly this day for Lisa, Joe, Debbie and Lynn, Matt, and all those we name before you now. Surround them with your love and provision, O Lord, and keep us ever turning outward with compassion and care, so all who long for a community of welcome and friendship may find it through us. Send us out in love with open eyes, ears, and hearts. Make us true neighbors to one another and true children of your own calling. We pray in the name of Christ who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.